Welcome to the Central Church YouTube channel. We hope that today's message blesses you in some way. Consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell to stay current with all the content we put online. Thanks again for being with us, and remember, you are loved at Central. It is good to see you today. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus 20, verse 15. If uh, you are new with us, uh, we, uh, I just want you to know how grateful I am that you have chosen to worship with us today. And uh, it is my prayer every, uh, every week uh, as we prepare for Sunday that uh, uh, this would be a blessing for you uh, and for us as we get to come in and worship uh, the risen Lord Jesus Christ together. And so uh, I hope that has been true of you uh, as well. Exodus 20 uh, verse 15 is where we're going to be as we uh, continue in this series that we've been in over uh, the last several weeks on the Ten Commandments, just looking to see what are the Ten Commandments have uh, to say to us today because uh, even though they are in the Old Testament, uh, we know that God still speaks, right? That uh, all of God's word is for all of God's people. And so uh, we want to hear uh, from what he has to say uh, to us today. And so well, we're going to look at a commandment, the eighth commandment, uh, that is <clears throat> probably uh, one of the more tame of the commandments, one of the commandments that really um, there's not a whole lot of disagreement with, that you shall not steal, right? That's not a a hard commandment, not a, uh, a, a debatable commandment, really. It's uh, just kind of uh, self-evident in many ways. Uh, in fact, the majority of Americans believe uh, that they have kept this commandment near perfectly. Uh, Barna did a survey not that long ago, and they found that 86% of U.S. adults claim to have satisfied God's command to not steal. 86% of U.S. adults have said, hey, uh, we're a lot of things, but we are not thieves. But, but that's difficult to square with one hotel after its first year of opening uh, reported its losses. After one year, they had lost 38,000 spoons. Um, now, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt here, right? Like maybe you've thrown the spoon away. I have four little hotel guests that live in my house. Uh, who throw silverware away from time to time. Uh, but then they, they had to replace 18,000 towels. Uh, now that's getting a little more difficult to justify, but this is the one that gets me. 355 coffee pots. Uh, now, what's interesting about this too is uh, this, this statistic is actually a pretty old statistic. It's from 1997. So we're not talking about Keurigs, right? Oh, we're talking about full coffee pots, which I don't get. Like, I don't drink coffee. I think it's bitter creek water. Uh, I just, I don't need that, right? I've got other things to make me bitter. But 355 coffee pots removed from the hotel room. And then the last one, I, I don't know how to feel about this one. I, I don't know whether it be encouraged or uh, discouraged. 100 Bibles, right? Over a year, uh, 100 Bibles were taken uh, from these hotel rooms. And so those statistics are difficult to square, right? 86% of U.S. adults say that they've satisfied this requirement, and yet 355 people stole coffee pots, right? Uh, 18,000 people took towels. 38,000 spoons had to be replaced. Stealing is an issue in our world today. We have people in this room who uh, they, they make their living through retail and they can tell you stories about shoplifting and different things. And so oftentimes when we think about stealing, we think about stealing as a problem over there, right? It's a problem that other people have, but I'm not a thief. I've never stolen anything. But what we see in this commandment, just like we've seen in every other commandment, is that there is more to this commandment than just simply, you shall not steal. No, this commandment, just like the other commandments, is saying something to our hearts. It's saying something to what we believe and how we live. And so as we look at this commandment, what we see is that stealing is really just a symptom of misplaced love. Stealing is a symptom of misplaced love. And, and here's what I'm willing to wager with, I think, 100% accuracy, is that every person in this room, either now or at some time, has struggled with misplaced love. 
has been guilty of loving the wrong things in the wrong ways at the wrong times. So look here at Exodus chapter 20 in verse 15. I, I know it's short, we've already said it, but uh, would you stand as we honor the, the reading of God's word? That As we read the word, Jesus speaks and Jesus says to us here in verse 15, Let's read it together. You shall not steal. Now, this is God's word. You can be seated. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Father, thank you for speaking to us. Father, we we pray that, that you would speak now. Father, I pray that that you would surprise us through your word and through this commandment. And Father, I pray that you you would help us to see where we are guilty, where we're struggling with misplaced love, with disordered affection. So Father, teach us now. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, stealing, it's a symptom of misplaced love. And so as we look at this passage and as we look at the rest of Scripture this morning, we're going to see three reasons that we steal, and we're going to see that, that these, uh, the reasons that we steal is because we love ourselves more than we love the right things. And so first we see this, that we steal because we love ourselves more than we love our God. We love ourselves more than we love our God. We said that stealing is a symptom of misplaced love, but but here's the truth. Every sin happens. Every sin is committed. Every sin is done because of a misplaced love. Because we have loved something more than we have loved our God. Now, sin isn't just the problem, but it reveals a greater problem and greater problems. Now, stealing is simple, right? This is easy. It's taking things that don't belong to you, it's, non, it's not a controversial command. It's a minimum requirement for just society. We, we teach our kids, right, do not steal. Don't, don't take that toy from your brother. Don't take that toy from your sister. Uh, you know, for kids, if they eat off of their brother or their sister's plate, like they take a French fry, that's stealing. My kids know that's the daddy tax, right? Like, I paid for that food. I'll eat that food if I want it, right? Uh, and, and so we teach early don't steal. This, this command, it assumes the legitimacy of, of, of owning property, of private property. Some people will, will take scripture and they'll, they'll take things that Jesus said and they'll, they'll twist it out of context and they'll say, see, we shouldn't own anything. But this command assumes that people will own things. And so we know that stealing is simple, but how do you become a thief? How does it happen? How does someone turn into a thief? Well, it starts with a misplaced love. That we love ourself over God. In fact, if I were going to summarize the Ten Commandments with one word, here's the word that I would use to summarize these Ten Commandments. Love. The, The first four commandments teach us how we love God. The last six commandments teach us how we love others. That's what these commandments are about. They're about how do we love well. And here's the problem is we never break just one of these commandments. See, if you break the eighth commandment, if you steal, well, the reason you broke that eighth commandment is as we'll see over the next couple of weeks, you were coveting, but also you were an idolater, right? You had committed idolatry. Or you had put another God before the real God. See, you never break just one of these commands. Now, remember how Jesus summarized the law. We've, we've read this passage several times, but I think it's important for us to keep it in front of us, especially as we study, study these commandments. So look at Matthew 22, verse 37. And he said to him, this is a, a lawyer's come to Jesus, and he said, he's tried to trap Jesus. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. That's how Jesus summarizes these uh, first four commands. And so when you sin against your neighbor, what Jesus is saying here and what he'll go on to say is, 
When you sin against your neighbor, you're sinning against your neighbor because you're failing to love God. Right? That, that, the, this first commandment, or the first and greatest commandment that Jesus gives there, is that we would love God with all that we are, with all that we have. And if we are committed to defrauding our neighbor, then we cannot be loving God with all that we are and with all that we have. The stealing reveals this, that we steal because we believe that we're lacking something that will give us happiness. We steal because we believe that we're lacking something that will give us joy. Now, you could take stealing out of that, and you could put any sin you want. Right? That we sin because we believe that that sin is going to make us happy. That sin is going to give us joy. That, that sin is going to satisfy us. But you know what the Bible calls it whenever we put our hope for joy and satisfaction in anything other than God? Idolatry. In fact, that's what idolatry is. Idolatry is taking joy and satisfaction into our own hands rather than trusting God with it. Idolatry is saying, God, I can't trust you for my good, so I'm going to do it myself. God, I can't trust you for my joy, so I'm going to make it happen on my own. I, I, I can't trust you for my satisfaction, so I'm going to take it, God. I, I'm going to do it. I, I'm going to handle it. But see, this eighth commandment is as much a call to trust God as it is not to steal. Now, Jesus, he clarifies for us, what does it look like to trust God? Look, look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So if you trust God, if you seek the kingdom, all these things will be added to you. Look at verse 34. Because you can trust God in seeking the kingdom, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for, it, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I don't know about y'all, but I, I need to memorize that verse. Right? The, because I can trust God, I don't have to worry. Because I can trust God, I don't have to steal. Because I can trust God, I, I don't have to sin. I don't, I don't have to look for all of these other things. I don't have to be anxious about tomorrow because sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And you know what's also sufficient for today? God's grace, right? Not only is the day have enough trouble, but we have enough of God's grace to cover today's troubles. Just like we had enough grace to cover yesterday's troubles, and God's gonna give us enough grace to cover tomorrow's troubles. Right? God doesn't leave us he doesn't forsake us, and we can trust him. See, the secret to joy isn't looking for more things that the world offers. The reason that you're constantly looking for pleasure, the, the reason you're constantly looking for joy, the reason you're constantly looking for satisfaction, it isn't because you just haven't found the right thing that the world can give you yet. The reason we look for those things is because we're looking for joy and satisfaction in all of the wrong places. Apart from Jesus, there is no joy. Apart from Jesus, there is no satisfaction. And so Jesus invites us to be satisfied by him. He says that, that if you will seek him and his righteousness, then all of these things will be added to you. Do you know what he's saying there in verse 33? Verse 33. He's saying that if you will make your aim first and foremost, God and his kingdom, then you will get everything that you're looking for. Now, he's not saying that, that if you will seek God and his kingdom, then God's going to make you rich. That's what the TV preachers say, but they're wrong. He, he's not saying that if you will seek God and his kingdom, then he's going to make you happy and healthy and wealthy. No, in fact, sometimes seeking God in his kingdom leads you to death. You ask our brothers and sisters who live in the majority world. For many of them, whenever they decide to start seeking Jesus, when they decide to start following Jesus, they don't get health and wealth and safety. They get death and threats and cut off. But what Jesus is saying, is that whenever you seek first the kingdom of God, then all of that joy and all of that satisfaction 
And all of those things that you're looking for, he will give you. He will delight your heart. See, understand this, that, that we were not made to be satisfied by this world. We were not made to be satisfied by what the world can give us. We were made to be satisfied by Jesus. If we were made to be satisfied by the things that the world gives us, then celebrities would be the happiest people in our culture. If we were made to be satisfied by fame and by money and by power, then celebrities would be the picture of wholeness. They would be the picture of health. I don't know if you have watched the news over the last hundred years, but it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. There's a reason why there's TV shows called Celebrity Rehab. Because they, they get to the top, they make all the money, they get all the fame, they get all the power, they can have any relationship they want. And they realize it's not enough. They realize it doesn't satisfy. And wouldn't it be great if we could just look at them and learn that lesson? But the human heart is easily deceived. And so we lie to ourselves. Even in this room, we, we can lie to ourselves and say, yeah, I know that Jesus satisfies. But how much more could I have if I'm satisfied by Jesus plus this? You know, you, you hear the question, you know, could you spend a million dollars in 10 minutes? I don't know, but I'd like to try. Right? <laughs> like, I, I, I would like to try and just see if I could. Uh, but if we think that stuff's going to satisfy us, then we're wrong. King Solomon, richest man to have ever lived. Even by today's standards, richest man to have ever lived. 700 wives and 300 concubines. Right, problem number one, right there, right? Uh, he, he's got all of the power. He's the king. He's got all of the money, the, the wealthiest man to ever live. He has all of the sex, all of the relationships, all of the fame, everything. And he gets to the end of his life and what does he say? Vanity of vanities. It's all vanity. If we're looking to be satisfied by what this world can give us, we will always end up disappointed. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has come to satisfy. Jesus has come to give us joy. Jesus has come so that we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil because our shepherd's with us. His rod and his staff comfort us. He leads us beside still water. See, we steal because we love ourselves more than we love our God, and we, we think we're wiser than him. There's a second reason why we steal. We steal because we love ourselves more than we love our neighbor. The, the Ten Commandments are a great diagnostic tool. Help us to see what's happening in our hearts. Maybe you've been driving down the road before, and the light comes on on your dash that says, check engine soon, right? Right? Maybe you've gotten the one that you don't know what it means, but you know it shouldn't be there, right? That that wasn't there before, that something has gone wrong. That's, that's what the Ten Commandments are. Uh, several years ago, we, we bought in our house one of these little robot vacuum things. Uh, its brand is like Ufi or something like that, so we just call him Ufi. He's like our dog. We don't have a dog, but we've got a vacuum cleaner. And, and every day uh, at like 545, he, he just goes. We never told him to do that. He just does it. And, and so it will be sitting around and he starts going at 545 and normally around six o'clock we'll hear beep, beep, beep. And then 30 seconds, and then beep, beep, beep. And what he's doing is he's telling us he's stuck. 
<laughs> and so then it becomes a game, all right, where is Yuffie stuck, right? Where's, and then it's like, oh, Yuffie, you know, and it's a vacuum cleaner, it's a robot, right? Like it's not a dog, but we treat it like a dog. And so then it's our, and it, he, he gets stuck under the couch somewhere. And so then it's, hey, one of the kids, can y'all climb under there and pull that vacuum cleaner out? But those beeps are telling us that something has gone wrong. Tell, it, tell us that he's stuck. Sometimes he'll beep because his battery is going dead and he didn't charge the night before. It, it's helpful to know when something's going wrong and that's what the Ten Commandments are. The Ten Commandments are a tool that we can use to diagnose, diagnose the, the problem in our heart. And so if we use them in the right ways and we, we come back to them regularly, they show us where we're placing our love. So there's this compound problem here in stealing, not only that we love ourselves more than we love our God, but also that we love ourselves more than we love our neighbors. And this is why stealing happens. In fact, when you love yourself more than you love your God and you love yourself more than you love your neighbor, then you are guilty of the same thing that the thief is guilty of. See, stealing is more than just taking what doesn't belong to you. It's any kind of unfair dealing with other people. Now see, God's people have always been called to be marked by, to be known by their love for their neighbors. We see this in Matthew 22. Jesus says the first and greatest commandment is you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's how he summarizes those last six commandments. But, but understand this. Jesus wasn't doing anything new or novel when he said that. Listen to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God's will for your life is that you would love your neighbor. But it's hard to love your neighbor when you're committed to treating them unfairly or less than fairly. See, love demands the opposite. The, the eighth command, every command in the Ten Commandments has an explicit or implicit negative. So here it's an explicit negative. Do not steal. You shall not steal. But for every explicit negative, there's an implicit positive. So if it's you are not to steal, that's explicit. There's a positive, a, a behavior you should do that is implied. So do not steal. The positive is be generous. Live generously. You know, I, I've heard, I, I've even said this before. You know, I, once, once I have a little more money, then I can be generous. But you know, it, it doesn't take money to be generous doesn't take wealth to be generous, doesn't, doesn't take experience, doesn't take any of those things to be generous. You know what it takes to be generous? Generosity. You know? Being generous. That, that's what the eighth command is calling us to do. Hey, if you aren't to steal, then what are you to do? You're to give. You're to be generous towards your neighbor. John Calvin said this, he said, if we are not to be condemned as thieves by God, then we must seek our brother's advantage no less than our own. What that means is we must seek the good of our neighbors. Now come back to Leviticus 19. There in verse 34, why was Israel to love the stranger? And God says, you shall love him as yourself because you were strangers. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. So why was Israel to love the stranger? Israel was to love the stranger because of God's grace to them. Right, we've seen this before in the Ten Commandments. We see it here again, that this is grace-driven, grace-fueled obedience, where God says that you obey because of what you have already received. You obey because of the grace that you have already been given. They were to love the stranger because God had loved them when they were strangers. God says that you were the strangers. And I came and I saved you. You know, sh strangers are those who don't belong, who are out of place. You might not ever see them again. I, I wonder if we've softened this command some. 
by using, unintentionally, using neighbor instead of stranger. Now, Jesus tells us to love your neighbor. Jesus was right, right? That's a given. But I wonder if we just kind of subconsciously make it easier to obey this command by using neighbor instead of stranger. Because when we think about neighbor, we think about people who live around us, which means they live like us, right? Maybe they have a house that looks like ours. Maybe they drive a car that looks like ours. They, they enjoy the same things that we enjoy. They, they look like us. They sound like us. They talk like us. They smell like us. But in Leviticus 19, you love the stranger who sojourns with you. The stranger is the person who doesn't look like you, who doesn't sound like you, who doesn't talk like you, who doesn't smell like you, who doesn't do the things that you do, and who probably can never repay your generosity. And so like, maybe our vision statement here at Central should be that we exist to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches for our neighbors and the strangers. That we exist for the stranger, and it's not because we want to sound good or look good, but it's because that's what God's called us to do. He's called us to love people who are not like us because that is exactly who we were when God first loved us. In fact, Scripture says that we weren't just strangers. You know what Scripture says? It says that we were hostile. That there was enmity between us and God. But you know what the good news about that is? Is that our hostility, our enmity, could not stop God's love. And so maybe that stranger's strangeness, rather than being something that stops your love for them, should be something that fuels your love for them. Because that's what God has done for us, isn't it? that he saw us like sheep without a shepherd, wandering away. And he has come and he has saved us. He has rescued us. He has redeemed us. Dane Ortland, <coughs> he's the author of a book called Gentle and Lowly. If you haven't read it, you, you should read that book. But he has this line where he talks about that the things that repel us are the things that make our God hug even tighter, love even harder. See, we love because we were the stranger. We steal because we love ourselves more than we love our God, and we love ourselves more than we love our neighbor. You can, if you're taking notes, put out to the side strangers. Finally, we see this, that we, we steal because we love ourselves more than we love the gospel. The gospel has something to say about who we are and how we live. It, it shows us where our love must be placed, and it, it gives us strength to keep it there. What we treasure reveals our hearts. That's what Jesus said. He says, where your treasures are, your heart will be also. But we're tempted to think that, that we put our treasure in all the right places and that it's just other people who are tempted to steal. It's just other people who are tempted to take. But we've seen that when we love ourselves more than God and we, we love ourselves more than others, then what happens is, is not only are we in danger of stealing, but we are guilty of the same thing that the thief is guilty of. In fact, when we love ourselves more than we love God and we love ourselves more than we love others, we are already guilty of stealing because we have robbed God of glory that only belongs to him. We've robbed God of worship that is only due to him. You ever had a conversation that just sticks with you for a long time? I, I was a sophomore in, high, er, in college, may, maybe a junior, and I was in a, a group of guys. Um, it was a discipleship group. It was a pastor and, and some of us. And I'll never forget uh, a friend named Corey. He's a, he's a doctor now. We were talking about sharing the gospel, practicing evangelism. And I'll never forget, we're going around talking about how we need to be better at it and we need to be more intentional and all of those things. And, and Corey speaks up and he says, he says you know, guys, he says, every time we meet someone or every time we're in a situation and we know we should share the gospel and we don't, we're robbing God of glory that he deserves. We're stealing from him. And so maybe, maybe you're not tempted to take a coffee pot from a hotel room. Maybe you're not tempted to take a towel or spoons. 
But maybe you're tempted to rob God of the glory that's due his name. Maybe you're tempted to love your convenience and your comfort more than the awkwardness that it takes to talk about the greatest news ever, that Jesus is alive. That Jesus rose from the grave. See, when we forget the gospel, we rob God of his glory. Loving the world and the things of the world, it's a sign of a heart that has lost view of what matters. See, the gospel tells us that this world is not our home, that, that we are just passing through, and that this world is not all that there is. But for the Christian, our home is not here. Our home is to come. In the fall, we're going to study the book of 1 Peter. And one of the reasons we're going to study the book of 1 Peter is because Peter does such a great job of calling us to see our identity as sojourners and strangers. I love what one translation puts it as strangers and aliens. That's who we are. That's who Christians are. We, this world is not our home. We are just passing through. We are strangers. We are aliens. This world should seem strange. And if this world does not seem strange to you, then maybe it's because you've lost sight of the gospel. And see, this eighth command is not just a command for the Christian to not steal, but it's also a call to love God and to long for the world to come. Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 6. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, Jesus identifies a problem here. We lay up the wrong kinds of treasures. When love is misplaced, we lay up treasures that don't matter, that don't last, and that will be destroyed. But when our love is placed on Jesus, we lay up treasures in heaven that do matter and that will last. And so if you want to use this commandment as a diagnostic tool to know how your heart is, then ask yourself this question. What are my treasures? Where are my treasures? I'm just talking about your bank account. What's the thing that you hold on so tightly to that if you lost it, you could not keep going? What's the thing that, if, that you hold on so tightly to that if it changed, or if it moved, or if it fell apart, you wouldn't know what to do. If, if that answer is first anything other than Jesus, then you've misunderstood the gospel. See, we lay up treasures in heaven when we live for eternity. When we live for eternity and we, we keep our eyes set on Jesus, and what happens is, is this world and its things grow less and less attractive. This world and the comforts that it can offer, the benefits that it can provide, when they grow less and less attractive, Jesus is growing more and more beautiful. Now see, Jesus is worth giving it all up for. He's worth laying our lives down for. This is, I'm, I'm so encouraged about what's happening at Central. We just about a year ago, we launched a family, the Mitchum family, to the mission field. Here in just a couple of weeks, we're going we're gonna to launch one of our ladies to a completely different part of the world. She's laid her yes on the table. And I said, Jesus, you are worth it. God, I'm not going to rob you of your glory. I am going to give you glory. See, stealing is a symptom of a misplaced love. And so the question that you and I have to answer today is this, is what do we treasure? What do you treasure? Are you treasuring Jesus? Are you holding tight to Jesus? Or are you treasuring other things? And here's what I can promise you. If you're treasuring anything other than Jesus, you will be disappointed. You will be frustrated. You will experience brokenness. But when you treasure Jesus, you get life. When you treasure Jesus, you don't get life, but you get life the way it was meant to be lived. So when you treasure Jesus, what happens is, suddenly, <clears throat> you can enjoy his gifts 
and his blessings the way they were meant to be enjoyed. I don't think possessions are a bad thing. I don't think money's a bad thing. I don't think any of that is a bad thing. It becomes a bad thing whenever you make it ultimate. But whenever you're treasuring Jesus above all of those things, then you can really enjoy those gifts that God has given you. Right? Then you can really enjoy those things that God has blessed you with. Because James tells us that every good gift comes from our Father above. Right? So what you have, you did not earn. What you have, you have because God has blessed you with it. Because God has given it to you. And so don't hold it too tight. But whenever you're treasuring Jesus, you realize that if I have Jesus, that I can never lose him. Because I can't lose what I didn't earn. Right? He's given himself to me. And so if you, you've, maybe you've never trusted in Jesus. Maybe you've never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Would you do that today? Would you not wait another moment to be satisfied by the one that your heart was created for? Don't wait another second for the blessing that Jesus has come to provide. He's, he's offering it to you right now. But if you have trusted in Jesus, here's, here's my encouragement to you, and, and I think Scripture's encouragement, is to keep trusting, keep treasuring, keep believing, keep looking to him. The way Paul says in Galatians, don't grow weary in well-doing. Right? Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. Thanks again for listening to today's message. Again, we hope that this message blessed you in some way. Now, you've come to church. Go be the church. Have a great week of worship.